the July 88 edition of Directions, AT&T's all-employee video magazine. Coming up, we'll hear from our new chairman, Bob Allen, and take a look at his career. We'll open up our family album and look at the dilemma facing Ron Shields, a communications technician in the remote mountains of New Mexico. We'll see how the Southern California Service Center recovered from the aftershocks of divestiture. And on the lighter side, we'll see how a magician keeps his business from disappearing with AT&T products. On Tuesday, April 19th in Denver, Colorado, one day before the 103rd annual shareholders meeting, AT&T's board of directors unanimously elected President and Chief Operating Officer Robert Eugene Allen to Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of AT&T. Born in 1935, Bob Allen graduated from Indiana's Wabash College. He began his career with Indiana Bell in 1957 at the age of 22. By the time he was 30, he was a division manager. In 1965, he attended the Harvard Business School's Management Development Program. In 1974, at age 39, he entered into the vice presidential ranks and at 48 became chairman of the Chesapeake and Potomac Telephone Companies. Upon divestiture in 1984, he became executive vice president of corporate administration and finance at AT&T. The next year, he became chairman and chief executive officer of AT&T Information Systems, and in 1986 was named president and chief operating officer for AT&T. Now at 53, after 31 years of service, Robert Allen is AT&T's 14th chairman and chief executive officer. I'm pleased to join you on this edition of Directions. My informants and employee communications tell me that about a fourth of you are watching directions. That's good news, that we're communicating with one another. And I'd ask each of you to tell three other people who might not see this show how much I appreciate all the extra effort that you've put forth over these past three months. AT&T has continued to perform well in recent months despite the distraction of Jim Olson's death the change in leadership at our data systems group, and the devastating fire in Chicago that disrupted our services for several weeks. Our commitment to the company's strategies are unchanged, but we need to accelerate the pace of change in our business and to accelerate the growth of our business. We need to take actions now that will protect and increase our market share, that will reallocate resources to support our customers. Our results to date are ahead of where we were, but they're not where we have to be if we're going to be successful in achieving a leadership role in a global marketplace. And that's where the business is going, globally. So make no mistake about that. I should also point out that as important as short-term achievements might be, they also need to have an impact on the future in 1990 and beyond. We need to move decisively in the short term while maintaining a long-term view. And we're not afraid of investing in our future. And if it makes sense for the future of AT&T, we'll make those right moves today that will yield those results far into the future. I have really a very simple message for you today. You've been great over the past few months and I ask you to keep it up. We need to continue to accelerate the momentum that we've created. We need your help in propelling the business forward and into the next decade. Customer loyalty is shifting. Competitors are stronger and better, as you well know, and the marketplace is tougher. And that's one of the reasons that we're shifting the staff people into these line assignments. They'll be at the leading edge, closer to the customer, working to grow the business and to ensure our future. Equally important are those of you who remain on the staff doing your own work, as well as those who have moved or gone out to the field. In closing, let me again thank you for your contributions to the well-being of the business thus far in 1988. And I just ask you to keep up the good work. From time to time, Directions looks into our family album to 
find personal portraits of AT&T people facing change. In these candid portraits, employees reveal their feelings about their jobs, their company, and their future. This time, we'll look at a communications technician confronted with a changing technology. My name is Ron Shields. I work for AT&T Communications. I'm a satellite maintenance uh, communications craft. I maintain six microwave radio stations here in New Mexico. The uh, systems I work on are mostly analog radio systems. First thing I do in the morning is fire up my computer that I hook to my telephone and uh, scan each one of my stations. And based on those results, then I'll load my truck up with the equipment I need and, and uh, hopefully I get into the right place at the right time. And I've got a pretty, pretty good success ratio of doing that. I feel like I live in kind of a unique area. Most people here in New Mexico, they think it's a desert. All of my stations are over 7,000 foot elevation. My tallest station is 9,500 foot elevation. Them ain't deserts. <laughs> Them are mountaintops. I call my own shots. I eat when I can. There's been many a time I'll get caught up at a radio station, never even get to eat at all. That's the other side of the coin then. You know, you have freedoms, and then sometimes you're caught by the need to provide service. In the wintertime, uh, travel time to the snowcat locations becomes very significant. Uh, oftentimes, in order to do a two-hour job, it requires six hours of travel. There's a lot of stress on the job, especially in inclement weather when you're out in, out in the snowcat. It's the fear of un uh, the unknown that gets you. Uh, you're out here up on a mountaintop, the closest human to you is about 12 or 14 miles away. Sometimes it makes you stop and wonder how intelligent you are, but nonetheless, you still go until you get there and get the job fixed. My interest in electronics probably started when I was in high school. I was become an amateur radio operator. Uh, just seemed like something neat to do. I received my training as a communications technician in the Air Force. It's kind of interesting. At that time, I thought I was selecting a uh, good career opportunity. We started out in the tube technology. We replaced all components and anything that failed. Then we went into the solid state technology. Uh, we were in discrete component type uh, repair work where we replaced the defective component in the system, put it back in service. Uh, now we're moving ahead into the black box era where rather than replace an individual component, we just go out, take out a black box, and plug in another black box. Now we're going to go out and build this new network out of, uh, we're going to use digital radio. Its backbone is going to be fiber optics. All the radio systems I work on are analog radio systems. Uh, going, to, going to digital radio is, is just one of the things we've got to do. The uh, competitive atmosphere that we're now facing, where uh, we've got to provide quality service, or we're going to come out losers. The transition from analog to digital is going to have a fairly serious impact on me because when the digital systems are in place and we start deloading the analog network onto the digital systems, people like myself that have had, you know, extensive electronics training uh, will no longer be required for these kind of jobs. Well, which is the way it's got to be, but it makes us feel like kind of kind of like dinosaurs. Am I going to have any options? I might have a few options uh, to go to the large metropolitan areas such as, as Denver or 
uh, San Francisco or Phoenix. My wife and I sat down and, and talked about it, looked, looked at some of the uh, statistics on it, and I just didn't see where my elbows would fit. As for the future, uh, I, I see that the, the transition from analog to digital is probably a necessary step. But in the meantime, we still got to exist in the real world. We're going to have another five years, at least, of a lot of analog radio systems. I thought I was ready for it because we'd had some minor ones and that we'd experienced locally. Uh, I wasn't ready for it. Uh, it was, I guess, sheer terror was my uh, reaction. Um, That's how shop manager that Bill Phillips earthquake. recalls the earthquake that shook the Southern California Service Center in Southeast Los Angeles, one of nine service centers across the country that distribute and repair AT&T products it is also AT&T's international warehouse for shipment of products overseas to the Far East and Pacific Rim countries. Today, the Southern California Service Center is rebuilding from an earthquake that shook the building in October 1987. For Bill and the others who work there, recovering from the earthquake was nothing compared to what hit them a few years ago. Well, just prior to divestiture and shortly thereafter, our business changed dramatically. We went from approximately 1,500 employees at this facility down to something less than 500. Um, the main reason for that was the decrease in demand for our services, repaired telephone sets and related equipment. The shock waves of change hit the service center hard. Phone repair lines were reduced from eight to two. Employees here averaged 20 to 30 years of service. Many worked here since high school. There had always been plenty of work, and morale and a sense of family was solid. But now, the survival of the center was in jeopardy. Repairing phones would not be enough. We created ba basically what we call a metal fabrication shop. The metal fabrication shop is three years old. It was created to meet a need in the marketplace for distribution frames, large metal racks for phone wiring systems. Leo Garcia, Jr. has worked at the service center since high school. For 20 years, he worked on the phone repair lines. On the telephone, we'd have three wires, three screws, check the ringer, but nobody really knew how a telephone worked. Over here, we work one step at a time until the final product is out. So you get to know all the jobs and how everything matches up. I like the machine shop, even though it's a lot more strenuous work. Uh, you get to think more. It is booming right now. Uh, we have more work than we really know what to do with. We're working overtime. Uh, we, today, we see two new people in the machine shop. And hopefully, a few more, a couple are working nights running the machines. So it seems to be growing. The metal fabrication shop was created by management, engineering, sales, and labor working as a team at the service center. There was little investment because the machines came from other factories and the service center could produce the frames cheaper than outside vendors. We basically, in about six to 12 weeks and for about $15,000 uh, investment, not only produced the first prototype, but actually uh, got into business and started producing the product on an assembly line basis. And uh, we're shipping them all over the country and very price competitive. So we saved the corporation a tremendous amount of money and in investment time and lead time to get the product on the market. Creating the metal fabrication business had a positive effect on employees. It's gone from employees saying, am I next, to employees saying, when am I going to get the opportunity to go down and do one of those other jobs? So there's a real positive atmosphere. The October 87 earthquake shook the Southern California Service Center at its foundation, just as the marketplace and divestiture did in 83. When work is completed, the building will be much stronger. For Bill Phillips and the employees at the service center who have survived both, a stronger bond has emerged. We sort of banded together in a team at all levels. So we got engineering, we got management, we got labor, we got everybody together and said, we're going to do this. And there's 
there's a market out there. We're going to satisfy that market, and we're going to give them good products and good services, and we're going to make money doing it. And they've done an excellent job of going from low morale and poor attitudes to let's get the job done and let's move on from here. It's been a dramatic change here. AT&T has combined information and commercials into infomercials to reach small business customers. We thought you'd enjoy seeing one with magician Dick Dale, who keeps his business from disappearing with AT&T products. I love magic. Magic has been my life since age eight. Uh, my dad brought home a few pocket tricks, the bug bit, and I it took off from there. Now, that looks like it's going through there. I mean, that's a good illusion, right? <laughs> that is illusion. This is reality. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> Magic is a fun business, of course. But what people don't realize is it's a business as well. I run three separate businesses. One is the entertainment business, one is a publishing business, and one is a manufacturing sales And I thank you very much. It's really interesting working out of your home. Competition in this business is fierce. And to set myself apart from the rest, I've got various tools. I've got a very aggressive marketing program. I've got the 1-800-AT&T Ready Line which is a marvelous marketing tool. It sets me just a notch above the rest of the competition. Here's a, a national number that I've got, exclusive to me, with a magic theme, and it puts me up on the level of the major corporations, I feel. 1-800-I-LOVE-MAGIC. I have several ways of marketing myself. I utilize a database in the computer. And depending on which market I want to head into, I just call up the proper database and aim out a direct mail piece, which is also published on the computer. I write a monthly column that various magic clubs, primarily in the Midwest, subscribe to. And dealing with the publisher and deadlines, now it's into the computer, over the wires, right to him. I'd hate to go back to paper and pencil days, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I have a, a magic business where I supply e effects and equipment to uh, dealers and magicians internationally. And the fax machine is just great. You know, I can receive a sketch from somebody and look it over and look at it from a manufacturing standpoint and say, no, we can't do this. Let's jiggle that one around a little bit and send it right back to them and get an immediate answer. And it's just an invaluable tool. The fax machine is magic to me. Well over half of my success can be attributed to the, the particular mix of communications and technology that I've got in this office. You just pick and choose what you feel is the best balance, and that's what I've done. AT&T, to me, is the cornerstone of communications business, and I really believe that. They've, they've got a good track record with me, they've got good product, they've got good service, and that's what I need. I've got a corporate partner, I feel. This has been the July 1988 edition of Directions, AT&T's all-employee video magazine. Thanks for all the encouragement you've given us through letters and surveys over the last year. Because so many of you have asked for it, with this edition, Directions goes bi-monthly. We'll be sending the program every two months, so it's important that you return your copy for recycling as soon as your group has finished viewing. The return address is on the cassette label. Thanks, and we'll see you in September.